you know, I ain't gonna hold you. So tonight we look at chapter seven and eight from um, Joe Silva's The Silver Mind Control Method of Mental Dynamics. So uh, title for chapter seven is Fear, Faith, and Courage. He says, to understand courage, it is necessary to comprehend the emotion called fear. Basically, there are two types of fear. The first is genuine fear, fear felt because of some genuine threat. Fear is a necessary tool for survival in all animals. It responds to danger by giving the individual a chemical smack of adrenaline to jolt the body into instant action. When you pass a dark alley late at night, the fear you feel that someone might jump out at you helps you make help makes you faster, more focused and stronger. The fear helps you to get away from danger immediately. However, fear that was designed long ago to prepare a person for a physical attack in the forest is not necessarily appropriate in the workplace. An executive, say, learns in a meeting that he or she may soon be fired. The thought of losing a job would create a fear in most of us. But what kind of physical act or reaction is proper in this situation? What should be done in response to a nagging worry that could last for weeks before it is resolved? Obviously, there is nothing on the physical level that can appropriately be done. Yet, the physical component of fear is a residue of our prehistoric past, still persists. Adrenaline flows, circulation is re redirected within the body, and so on. Prolonged fear, often known as unremitting stress, can actually damage the body. So before we get into it, however, let's take a look at the second category, illusory fears. Illusory fears, though just as genuinely felt, are based upon misperceptions or false commands emanating from a person's inner tapes. Many people spend their lives in a constant state of anxiety and ha have no idea where it originates from. Others suffer from phobias, greatly exaggerated, distorted responses to something perceived as a hazard. Illusory fears are the bane of their existence. Reprogramming illusory fears to convert them to positive expectations enhances one awareness and self-esteem. As the self-esteem improves, one in turn becomes less and less prone to react to illusory fears. Aside from improving self-esteem, how can you handle illusory fear? First, let's try to gain greater awareness by defining the word using the principle of polarity. When you, example, when you examine the opposite meaning of a word, the concept that you are attempting to understand is unlocked, leading to more awareness. To define the word fear, we go to our polarity gauge and lay it out with the negative pole on the left end and on the positive end and a positive pole on the right. We will call fear a negative and under the word negative put expectation. On the right end of the polar polar polarization gauge will be the words positive expectation. It might also be termed faith. Faith and fear then are the same, differing only by degree. To eliminate a fear, Polarize it. Switch to a positive result of the thing you fear. Take for resistance our example of the executive who is about to be fired. The first reaction might be to visualize the difficulties of a reduced income and the lessened prestige that would likely accompany his dismissal. But what are the positive aspects of losing the job? Our executive might think of a period beyond of the immediate difficulties and start to see this as an opportunity to do what he or she really wants to do. Perhaps to move to another area, switch fields, or explore a number of attractive possibilities not previously available. Another benefit of changing your viewpoint is that it helps you identify and develop your desires. When you hold a positive desire, the result is usually a positive expectation. And as we've just seen, a positive expectation, faith, serves to diminish a fear. You might initially think courage, not faith, is the opposite of fear. But consider that courage only exists where there is fear to be overcome. Without fear, there can be no courage. You would just act. To ask yourself why you are fearful leads nowhere but because fear is an abstraction. Better to ask yourself what you expect of the negative nature to happen. Then you begin to close in on a useful answer. In considering your debilitating fears, ask yourself the question, what would I be doing and what would my life be like if I did not expect this bad thing to happen? Now you're transmuting for your imagination brings into play all the positive possibilities. 
And at last you have a weapon to fight the fear. The next chapter is chapter eight, guilt and self-forgiveness. So in chapter three, five rules of happiness, you learn that the first rule of happiness is if you like a thing, enjoy it. And that there are only two reasons not to enjoy something you like, fear and guilt. Having dealt with fear in the last chapter, let's examine guilt. More than any other emotion, guilt puts a heavy burden upon us both spiritually and mentally. Guilt has been laid upon our shoulders by many authority figures, by parents, teachers, and friends, by the media, by our government, and our educational and religious institutions. The burden of guilt is placed on us for two reasons, to control and to punish. To understand guilt better, we must first be aware of what precedes and what comes after guilt. For guilt is part of a threesome, accompanied by two fellow travelers, sin and punishment. Let's define all three words. Sin is just a missing of the mark. Guilt is a compulsion to repeat and act correctly. Punishment is a reminder that comes along when the act is not repeated correctly. Forgive yourself for you could have done it no other way. Forgive yourself for you will not do that again. You are more mature. If 20,000 angels with 20,000 Bibles in their hands were to attest to the new you and forgive you for all your past misdeeds, yet you remained unforgiving of yourself, then you would not feel forgiven. On the other hand, should the whole world condemn you and you forgive yourself, then you will feel forgiven. The key lies within your own imagination, for this is where guilt, sin, and punishment reside, in that image-making capacity of your mind. Imagine you have forgiven yourself and you will have been forgiven. The way to neutralize guilt is through self-forgiveness. To forgive yourself, you must understand that the you of today would not act in the same way as you did, as the same way as did the past you. If a particular incident is hampering your growth, go to the level and review the event. Go over it thoroughly, just as you remembered it happening. Put a blue frame around it and compress the frame until the scene is diminished. When the frame compresses to the size of a bean, imagine it disappearing in a poof. Bring the event to mind once again. This time, imagine how you would act in your present resources. Picture the incident with the actions of a new, more mature you. White frame the scene and focus on it. You can forgive yourself because you have grown a new awareness. Proof of that is the guilt you felt about the incident in the first place. And with awareness comes the realization that you wouldn't handle that event in the same way again. You are your actions. You now have new actions and are a new you. While at level, put the first three fingers of either hands together and say, I forgive myself for all my past actions. From this moment forward, I will be the best me that I know how to be. When you come out of level, live your life the best way you know how. Be the best you that you can be. That's been chapter seven and eight. Thank y'all for listening. Enjoy.